afternoon. We are here for the funeral of, and I'd like to introduce to you the Sullivan who will be giving the funeral this afternoon. Her name is Charlotte Ulett. There's some flowers in the other room, Kathy. Okay. Kathy is Kathy is one of the family members, and she's going to be passing them out to the group. Are they on the table here? Yes, they're purple lilacs. Oh, and everybody's going to hold on to one. And then, uh, Kathy is one of the family members, and she's going to be passing it out to the guests. Everyone gets purple lilac. Welcome. Before we begin, I would like to announce that the family invites you to join them for refreshments straight after the ceremony, and it would be appreciated if you would please turn off your cell phones at this time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Charlotte Ulett, and I am a celebrant. On behalf of the family of Mr. Cornelis Groenvelt and Lapine Funeral Homes, I thank everyone for coming to share the honor the memory of Opa, as the family knew him in this ceremony today. Holland, beautiful Holland, birthplace of Cornelis Groenveld in the year of 1921. On the 16th of November, near Rotterdam, he was born to Cornelis and Loyla, named after his father and one of five handsome brothers, Wim Obe, Dick, and Jacques, standing Dutch proud and dignified, as you can see in this lovely sepia-colored photograph of the family. The other day at her father's home, home, Helena revealed to me with a smile on her face and a twinkle in her eyes that her father was mischievous and headstrong ever since he was a lad. The brothers would have to attend the Dutch Reformed Church three times a day if they were naughty. Young Cornelius was naughty indeed. At church, he would pull the buttons off his jacket for his offertory plate and use the coins to play pool with his mates. An average student in many ways, except one, Cornelius followed in the tradition of great Dutch masters. He was born a brilliant artist. As an infant, instead of a baby rail, he must have had a paintbrush in his little fist. In fact, his family told me that out of the five sons, he was the only one trusted with his father's treasured working tools because Cornelius took care and showed much respect for all things in life. Trained as a painter and as a decorator and taking years to qualify, he was highly skilled, deeply passionate, and serious about his work which is a famous Dutch trait, to be sure. He worked painting private homes in ships in dry dock. The ships would later, later call to him, and their magnitude and importance would unleash his creative spirit and sent him sailing and soaring as a painter. Cornelius was close to his brother's five, particularly with the youngest and the last surviving brother, Jacques. Sadly, he could not make the journey to be with us today to honor his brother's memory. Jacques and Cornelis shared a very special bond. Both were avid photographers and musicians who found great fulfillment in playing the organ. Their brotherly friendship was an unspoken joy. Cornelis, oh, he met and married his lovely wife, Kobe, in Rotterdam, and the 17th of September, 1947, both were married. Both were musical. Cornelius played the organ and had an extraordinary talent to read music vertically without missing a beat, an art in itself. Kobe played the mandolin, but following their marriage, ceased to play. The couple came to Australia, where Cornelius was 26 and their firstborn daughter, Los, was two years of age. It was a long and arduous plane trip to finally reach this new country, Australia. They would now call home. Their second daughter, Elena, would arrive a little later. Cornelius continued to work as a painter and decorator in Melbourne. He had a loyal clientele base 
who appreciated his professional and personal integrity. And as we all know, he was an absolute perfectionist, underlined and underscored. For several years, he and his wife, Kobe, had their own paint shop on Riverside Road in Camberwell. His extraordinary skill and aptitude for mixing paints was unparalleled. John, his son-in-law, expressed that he had a scientific approach to his craft. He painted not only professionally, but also personally. Copious and magnificent vast canvases at his home studio. Subjects diversified as animals, landscapes, and ships on the water. An impressive an impressionist painter, Cornelius conquered the Dutch mastery of light and dark. His paintings were larger than life, illuminating, breathtaking, haunting. Here are poignant words from the epilogue in Shakespeare, The Tempest, and I quote, Gentle, breath of yours, my sails must fill or else my project fails. Spirits to enforce, art to enchant. Cornelius, you have enchanted us with your art in life. You observed on the fringes of life, but in art you were set free, soaring high above mediocrity. His work was exhibited at many art shows, including the prestigious Herald Outdoor Art Show, which is an unusual event here in the beautiful city of Melbourne. The former Prime Minister Sir Robert Menzies acquired his work and commissioned commercial design firms populated his nautical motif. Cornelius expressed his creative soul, his inner emotional self through his works, and with that he leaves behind a legacy of children, their children, and their children's children with art and music evident in their lineage and their heritage. I would like to share with you now, on a personal note, if I may, that I was deeply moved and felt part of the very special place at his, as his family invited me to really look at their father's artwork on display everywhere, on most every wall in his house. Here was a prolific man who could miraculously paint on huge, huge canvases. As we stepped out into the lovely garden that Loyla created years before, now in full bloom on an early summer's day, strangely, and the bursts of pinks and oranges would pale in comparison to Oprah's expression and celebration of nature. He certainly brought the outside in. Truly fantastic. Thank you for allowing me this honor. And now Oprah's daughter, Los would like to read this loving words from painter Pablo Nareda as a reminder of her father as she holds his memory in his heart. Los Comida. In her heart. <laughs> okay, right here. Okay. When I die, I want your hands on my eyes. I want the light and wheat of your beloved hands to pass their freshness over me once more. I want to feel the softness that changed my destiny. I want to live while I wait for you asleep. I want your ears still to hear the wind. I want you to sniff the sea's aroma that we love together, to continue to walk on the sand we walked on. I want what I love to continue to live, and you whom I love and sang above everything else, to continue to flourish full-flowered so that you can reach everything my love directs you to, so that my shadow can travel along in your hair, so that everything can learn the reason for my song. Thank you. What kind of man was Cornelius? His daughter describes him as complex, private, deeply human, difficult, argumentative and shy. Some would say and many thought he was pompous and arrogant, a man who chose the safety of social isolation. 
It may have appeared that he was not interested in the rest of humanity, and yet the same man worked hard in a committed way to provide for his family and expressed sentimentally in a way that disarmed them, keeping cards, letters, and treasured photographs of his extended family. That was Opa. You see, he was in his quiet, unemotional way very proud of all of you. Indeed, an extension of the pride he felt in everything that he was and all that he did. His car, 11 years old, I believe, had racked up only 50,000 kilometers, immaculately kept, indication of all we know about him. It is true that he remained aloof, and yet like many of us, that searched with inner longing to connect with the world, he did the best he could. Early on in his life, his health was compromised by prothesis, a rare disease. In the late 70s, he required hip surgery. The surgery was unsuccessful. To be unable to climb a ladder central to his profession devastated him and forced him into early retirement. On a positive note, following retirement, he and Kobe learned and enjoyed swimming and together accomplished competency at many levels. The fates were not kind. Ten years ago, his eyesight diminished, losing 80% of his sight in one eye, and he never painted again. Music befriended him. He returned to playing the organ until his hard-working hands were assailed by arthritis, making it impossible for him to play. Colby's death eight years ago further diminished him. He guarded against showing his deep emotion, but in reality, he too died a little that day. He never recovered, and he became increasingly, increasingly reclusive, no doubt grateful for the support of his family, which endured. I would like to ask his daughter, Lozana Elena, to share their thoughts. As you people are aware, Cornelius suffered depression, and as it increased, the spoke of deep loneliness, the huge void in his life, and concerns for his future. In the week of his death, he experienced the pain of the anniversary of Kobe's death. In his own way, he did miss her, deeply expressing a longing to be with his wife again. It was also the week of his 80th birthday. This highly intelligent, very contemplative man, remember he had limited uses of his precious hands and eyes, had many times contemplated his own end. The end came at the time of his own choosing, in his home that was his sanctuary. The peace that has so long eluded him was now destined to be his. It is appropriate now to pause for a moment. Those who are believers might like to pray. Others might choose to reflect on his life and the meaning it holds for you. During this time, the family has chosen a special song for you to listen to that Opa very much enjoyed. That song, which I would have played now, but I don't have it, is Il Von Van Holland, which translates means My Beloved Holland. So this little lovely piece of music plays. Our thoughts are with the family, to his daughter Lois and Elena, their husbands John and Max, his brother Jacques, the grandchildren Mark, Benita, Christina, Ruth, Shane, and Jason, and their partners Tam, John, and Thomas. Opa's great-grandchildren, Natasha, Rebecca, Nicholas, Andrea, Chloe, Mira, Aiden, and James. To Nola, his sister-in-law, family and friends, and everyone who came to know and care for this man, we extend to you our deepest sympathies. I ask the grandchildren here in the front row to come up and take a paintbrush that belonged to their grandfather, from the bowl and to put a lovely flower that you are holding in its place, one at a time.
Now will everyone please repeat after me. We surround Oprah's spirit with love and light. We surround Oprah's spirit with love and light. Thank you. The direct family will say their private farewell to Oprah later. Therefore, I will say the words of committal at this time. At this time, please stand tenderly and with honor and appreciation. We remember the life of Cornelius Groenfeld. He is now beyond harm fear and pain, and here, in this last rite, we commit his body to the elements. You may be seated. Cornelius loved to intricately paint ships making their tumultuous way on the wide open sea. The color blue in every hue abounds. His soul was that of the quintessential adventurer. I give you this reading and ask you to close your eyes right now and picture for a moment Cornelis on the shores of his studio, silent and totally immersed in his world of art, painting, painting. I ask Oprah's son-in-law, Stephen, to share this poem from Alfred Lord Tennyson that captures Cornelius' spirit. Stephen. Break, break, break on thy cold gray stones, O sea. And I would that my tongue could utter the thoughts that arise in me. And the stately ships go on to their haven under the hill. But oh, for the touch of a vanished hand and the sounds of a voice that is still. Thank you. May you open your eyes. And I urge you that in Cornelius' name, before sun sets on this day, that you reconcile with someone in your life. Reach out, ring them up, or write them a letter. Go ahead, create anew. And in this way, Opa lives on with his everlasting brush strokes on your life's canvas. Thank you, Opa, for all that you were and all that you gave us as we say to you now, love and light on this your journey. journey. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes the ceremony honoring Opa's life. Please stay and join the family for refreshments. At this point, Blue Danube comes up. And so this beautiful sound of the symphony. And that's it. That's all. That's one job. Mm -hmm. Very nice. I think the thing that I like, oh, it was really very, very sensitive um, <coughs> ceremony because mm. <laughs> it's like with these ceremonies that you do, these people become part of you, even the ones that you never met. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's really a beautiful thing. Um, I just want to say something. That after the ceremony, where we went, I was in, obviously, Australia, and the celebrant that was supposed to do the ceremony, her mother got sick. And I had to write it in, uh, in like, overnight, and then do the ceremony the next day and have them, have them all prove it. You did a beautiful job. It was what? <laughs> I, well, I, I had gone with the celebrant on an interview with the family, and I was there in the house, and he was a pistol. He was not liked by the family, and he was nasty. So, And also he had a lot of love, but a lot of pain. So uh, the celebrant who taught me how to write a funeral ceremony said, go up, bring the, the the, everybody up so it's life affirming and then say but he had these horrible devastations and almost like a wave like you right. felt like I was I was feeling but it what happens is you're giving them a little bit you're getting closer and closer and closer to the bone and then with the children bringing up they, actually we didn't have the flowers it just came and brought up the, got the uh, paintbrushes now after the ceremony it's customary in the Australian custom uh, tradition that the funeral home Many of them women owned and operated, by the way, and they're very light and airy and beautiful. Mm 
They have a catering in the back, and you have you know tea and scones and little sandwiches, and everybody goes in the back there. Uh, but first, what had happened was, and we would do this, uh, I would gesture for the funeral director to come back up. He would gesture for the pallbearers to come up, and they would take the casket. You would stand. I, I met with the funeral director about an hour before because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and I didn't know what they were accustomed to do. So I stood, you know, my right hand over my left, and the pallbearers took the, the, the casket, and they lifted it up, and, you know, with the poles that are on either side. The two rows, the family got up. We went outside in a procession to the hearse. The hearse was, let's say this is the hearse at this point. Uh, facing underneath the canopy of the funeral home going out to the gate. And the body, the casket rather, was put into the car. At no time do you wear sunglasses. You always have your eyes free of sunglasses. You can wear regular ones. <laughs> and uh, they put the, uh, you know, the casket in the car. And you stand there and the funeral director takes care of everything. He closes it. Okay. And everybody stands aside. Maybe the family members that are not going to the funeral home later, or this in this case, Cornelius went to the crematorium. So um, they put flowers on the casket, they closed the door. They, the, the funeral director asked if anyone has anything that they would like to lie on, the, the, their flowers or whatever. And then um, the funeral director and I proceeded in front of the car and walked to the gate, and had our hands here, as the car went out to the crematorium. Now, at this point, we went back in, and there was a luncheon served, that, because that's what they do. Or the family brought food, but they had it catered in the back. And it was really very nice. It was a different, it wasn't this big thing that Americans do. It was more home, it was very home style. They had a little place in the back where everybody talked and spoke. And he had a lot of his um, memorabilia around. He had his paintings, his brushes, so the family was, you know, gathering that. And actually even uh, giving it to the, uh, the, the kids and the grandchildren, whatever. And... Uh, but these are some of the things that you should know because maybe at this point in time, when the, the hearse leaves the gate, you would get into your car and go to the funeral home. You might do the committal there. It might not be in the ceremony. Mm -hmm. When you do that, make sure your car goes in last so you can get out first and your car doesn't get trapped. I think if you've got some of the notes on that. Um, but you may do the committal right there. You may be in the, uh, the, the mausoleum. Uh, or then again, you might not be working uh, with a funeral home that you're having a casket. It could be an urn, and there might be an interment of the ashes. These are the kinds of things that when you are a funeral celebrant, you will find out. That's on the questionnaire, everything that's involved. But I can say you know, that that's, those are the things that you need to know. Uh, and there's places where you have to stand when you're at a funeral, when, when you're at the grave uh, site. And there's also traditions that one must know if there is going to be any religious aspect to the ceremony. You know, the Greeks, the Jews, the Italians, the, the, everybody's got something, you know. So even though the person may not be particularly religious, there's certain things one does. And then, then you might be asked to, to, to perform that. So um, there's the ring and the uh, little bell at the end of the ceremony. <laughs> so do you have any... Questions and I'm sorry I cried just oh God. Well, I'm actually so super relieved that like to see you actually show some emotion because like I'm like thinking you know this is really heavy like not not well it's a suicide to right. the guy you know but you, you handled it so beautifully you you showed the appropriate amount. Of you, you didn't say everything is wonderful, but you didn't slap them in the face either, and that is decorum, and that's what people who are in grief really need. But to, to show that you actually felt something about it, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it without having that emotion at some point. I mean, I won't cry in front of the family. I'm going to try not to, but it is an overwhelming thing. It's an overwhelming thing, and I'll tell you when you may cry. You may cry when one of the family members comes up to read something, because it is touching. You have your little Kleenex, you do this, <laughs> you do this, you pat them on the back, you hold them for a minute, and everybody's crying, because if you're crying, you know everybody else is crying. 
And really, it's not like you're bawling crying, you know, but you're crying because, and it's real, it's a real moment, it's a real emotion. And it's appropriate. It's very, very appropriate. So there's times when in a wedding ceremony, somebody will do, you know, a father will, will grow, just, you know, start crying and ever, everything, and then I'll just get on the microphone and I'll say, this is a beautiful moment, isn't it? And everyone's crying and they're all going like the... So, but the thing is, that's the wedding. What do you do for a funeral? The funeral, you can tastefully cry. You can go like this because it isn't a moment. Everybody feels it. And really, I want to tell you the truth. Whether it's for a human or any other kind of being, I'm serious. This is true. <laughs> that... These things, life is, is, is just a beautiful thing. And we had a ceremony, you're going to laugh at me, but they were cutting down a tree. And a friend of mine wanted me to do a tree ceremony, and she talked about what this tree meant to her in her life. And they had to cut it down. By, by the end of the ceremony, I was, I was like, I didn't, wasn't the wedding celebrant. I mean, I wasn't the officiant <laughs> for the tree cutting ceremony. But she <laughs> wanted to say it was just her friends, but it was very emotional for this tree to to have to go away, you know, and not be a part of our lives anymore. It was, and I started thinking about all the other trees. But these are the things that happen when you're a celebrant. You will have a moment that gets you. And, but that's okay because it's getting you. And also, these words are strong. You are really, yes, you are you're letting out the emotion and you're bringing it in. Also, you're, you're gathering it all into. And uh, many celebrants I found when I went to Australia and I was doing, going from one ceremony to the next, after the ceremony, the celebrant would sit in, this, in their car and cry. Mm -hmm. Just to get it, it was all that working with the family, uh, funerals, or, yeah, to release it. And also, they're, they're going to miss the family sometimes, you know, I mean, <laughs> unless they, they forget to pay them. <laughs> they get mad, I'm just kidding. Don't worry about that. They never get it. <laughs> <laughs>